12,000 people arrive in Australia each week, some for holidays and some for business. And then there are a few whose arrival becomes the business of the Australian Federal Police. We knew we were dealing with a minimum of $50 million worth of drugs. About seven metres from our location, we found a guy laying on the ground. The last thing I expected to find was a dead body. Potentially a murder may have occurred. He didn't seem too ruffled by the situation at all. We were pretty sure the uh, importation would occur at any stage. You have to wait and be there at the right time with the right equipment at the right place. The Australian Federal Police had been given a tip that a large amount of narcotics was about to enter our shores. They had no idea where or when it would happen, but they did know if it wasn't stopped, a massive quantity of heroin would hit the streets, resulting in other crimes and possibly deaths. The only intelligence they had was that a Mr Teng had arrived in town. Once we received the information in relation to Teng, um, our team started checks into his background, into his arrival in Australia, and into his uh, location in Melbourne at the time. The task for the surveillance branch was to uh, follow Mr Tang around to see exactly what he did, who he met, where he went. Well, I'm videoing a guy who looks very much like him, standing uh, near the uh, crossing. Our first point of actually seeing Tang was uh, in and around the Crown Casino in Melbourne. He's standing uh, near the crossing, smoking a cigarette. Yep, that's our man. And then we discovered he was using a Tarago van to drive around Melbourne. Some checks that were carried out determined the car had been hired from Europe Car in Geelong, a fair way from Melbourne itself, not somewhere where a tourist would usually go to hire a car when there's so many car rental places around Melbourne. Um, such a large vehicle for one person seemed interesting. For three days, the surveillance team followed Mr Teng and the van back and forth from Melbourne to Geelong. Still on the phone, smoking, just swirled around a bit, so he's facing away from the water. His movements around the shoreline and the piers around Geelong, it was almost as if he was surveying the area, possibly even familiarising himself with, with certain aspects of the geography of the area. Although he was staying at Crown Casino, and I guess you could say he was gambling of an evening, Certainly, uh, his activities didn't fit with the normal activities of a tourist. While surveillance was kept on Mr Teng, federal agents took a chance and spoke with the manager of the company from where the van had been rented. It paid off. Their target had inquired about renting another car. Mr Teng stated that he wanted a four-wheel drive. His family was coming out here and he needed it for luggage, which we, at that stage, believe was false. We thought he was going to put something sizable in the boot there and it wasn't going to be luggage. The idea of boot space, if it was narcotics, what quantity are we looking at? We thought well, we must be looking at a reasonable size importation, if in fact that was what he intended to do. Europe Car Geelong didn't have a four-wheel drive available, so the AFP actually rented a four-wheel drive on their behalf and had it set up ready for Ting to rent from Europe Car. The next day, the four-wheel drive with listening devices was delivered. Europe Car, on our behalf, contacted Teng, stating they'd just come across a four-wheel drive that was available for his rental, and that allowed us to get Teng back to the office so we could take some surveillance of him and commence our uh, monitoring of his movements and any conversations that he may have. He looked at the four-wheel drive, looked again at the Tarago, and decided there wasn't enough room in the four-wheel drive itself for what he wanted it for. When you have these operations, things seem to go smoothly for, for a period of time. All of a sudden, it's Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. And that's what makes these operations difficult, trying to control the movements of somebody that has no idea they're being looked at, but often they just uh, go off and do their own thing as, as they want. My boss now, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I have to bring it down from Melbourne. 
However, the manager at Europe Car was able to walk out and actually look at the two vehicles in their discussions. He noticed uh, another male in the Tarago van with Teng, another Asian male, and he also noticed in the back of the Tarago some luggage and the details on one of the luggage related to a person by the name of Lamb. Police began checks on this person, Lamb, but their target was always Mr Teng. Wherever he went, they went, and he, along with this Mr Lamb, we're now heading further round the coast to the surfside city of Lorne. Time is 4.51 on the 11th of April, 2003. Subject having a cigarette out the front. His associate in the driver's side of the Tarago, yet to uh, exit the vehicle. A team went from your car, Geelong, to uh, Lorne and made inquiries at a real estate agency. Real estate agent, Smythe. After his conversations were completed and he'd left the area, one of our investigators approached the real estate agency and again making a judgment call, um, discussed his conversations with them about renting a property. Subject entering vehicle. Mr Teng made inquiries, fairly solid inquiries about the rental premises, up on a hill in Lawn there. And uh, my first impression personally was that something would be happening in the next few days. As it turned out, he, he transited back to Geelong and back to Melbourne. However, he had made inquiries in Geelong also. So to me, it felt like he was basically hedging his bets. With Teng back in Melbourne and spending the night at the blackjack tables, police were able to install a listening device into his van. The chess game, as federal police saw this operation, was underway. And if they wanted to win the game, they needed to be one step ahead of his every move. Mr Kiem Fa Teng had spent the last two weeks travelling to the south coast of Victoria. Sometimes alone, and at other times in the company of a man police believed was a Mr Lamb. But federal agents didn't believe their interest in the coast was to find a place to go fishing. But a place where a large shipment of narcotics could be dropped off. To find out where and when, federal agents were able to install listening devices into the van he had already hired. However, Teng decided the next day he'd actually wander on foot around the Melbourne Central Business District. So uh, the AFP had to fall back to our physical surveillance of Teng. Yeah, he's leaning up against the wall and uh, yeah, he's looking around a fair bit and he just looked down to his watch on his right wrist. One minute later, the reason was clear. Our man's meeting with a UI just underneath the uh, walk bridge. He was seen to meet up with another male, again an unknown, a separate male to that, and seen in the vehicle with him at Geelong. Well, you know, I'm close to the dark grey pants and he's got black shoes. Dark grey pants, black shoes and a long black jacket. Okay. They were seen to wander around Melbourne together, to sit down and have lunch or a meal, have a number of deep uh, conversations and then to utilise a public phone box in the city and to make numerous calls from that public phone box. There was a phone box. Yeah, copy that. Mate, if there's a split here, would you be able to put the UI to a car or some sort of transport? Fortunately, this unidentified individual stayed with Teng. The two had jumped into the van that had been installed with listening devices, and investigators were now privy to their conversations. They travelled from Melbourne, again down towards Geelong, had a conversation in the vehicle. The second male made comments relating to Ting's involvement in international drug trafficking, and that uh, penalties for the type of activities they were going to be undertaking would in some cases be 20 years, and in other cases five. And this led the AFP to now feel pretty certain that Teng was definitely involved in an imminent importation into Australia of narcotics. On reaching Geelong, the two males walked along the Cunningham jetty. Their conversations in that vehicle led us to believe that would be an area where they'd change over the narcotics at a later stage. There were lots of people around, lots of people carrying things, and that they could basically bleed into the background they noticed a beach marker in the Cunningham jetty area, 57B. And they actually utilised that as a point where they could meet up and do a changeover. The two men then moved on to Lawn, and the conversation in the car became coded. 
in relation to the narcotics. They were calling girlfriends. They were talking about picking up the girlfriends, handing the girlfriends on to others, and at the same time that the girlfriends would be delivered by speedboat. We knew there was possibly boats involved. We knew there was 150 units, or that was the figure they were talking. Units are a 300 gram block, a 700 gram block. It depends on their particular jargon, the criminal's jargon. If you look at it in terms of the street value, each kilo is a million dollars, and that's probably an underestimation. So we knew we were dealing with a minimum of $50 million worth of drugs, up to $150 million worth of drugs. And the higher the stakes the, the criminals are playing with, the more danger, obviously, for everybody involved. That being the case, we had to make sure that we had an appropriate amount of resources and appropriate level of uh, members available to undertake a safe arrest once we're at the resolution stage. So what we had to do was just get down there, get all kitted up and be ready for the hundred different situations that could occur. And so it was a case of hurry up and wait. Uh, in, in that case, it's very much like the army. You have to wait and be there at the right time with the right equipment at the right place. We have to be prepared at all hours of the day to uh, respond at an appropriate level, whether that's two in the morning after no sleep or just during a normal business day. We'd just taken 10, 15 minutes break to have something to eat. Yeah, Roby. And uh, we received a telephone call that surveillance had lost contact with Mr Tang in the Geelong area. And that one of the possibilities was that Mr Tang was travelling towards Lawn. All right, we'll keep an eye out. All right, good. My partner and I decided to position the vehicle at the entrance to Lawn, being that there's only one way into Lawn, and we knew that the vehicle had to travel down that road. Personally, I didn't think they would be travelling back to Lawn because of the time of the evening, unless, of course, something, something else was going to occur. I remember saying to my partner there that, that we could be here all night, and the first set of headlights that rolled through Lawn it was the silver Tarago. What would normally take an hour to travel from Geelong to Lawn had taken them only half the time. But they didn't stop at Lawn, and Agent Roby and his partner were in pursuit. We were the only two cars on the road. I was very wary not to be too close to the back of the Tarago, being the only other vehicle on the road made inquiries as to how far surveillance were going to be. And I was told that surveillance would probably be another 15 to 20 minutes behind. My partner and I realised at that stage that if anything significant was happening within the next 15 to 20 minutes, then, then we'd be the two members that would be required to do something. His premonition appeared correct. On the horizon, a boat appeared. A boat that had never been and shouldn't be in Australian waters. At this stage, Federal Agent Chris Roby and his partner were following the Trago around the Great Ocean Road at fairly high speeds on an extremely bad night. That being the case, we were quickly trying to have other surveillance members move down into the area to assist Chris Roby. We lost sight of the car for a good two or three minutes around the bluff, and I, I remember making that turn around the bluff and seeing quite a large ship, no more than a kilometre off the shore, and it was very, very well illuminated. It certainly was some sort of indicator for this vehicle. I'm certain of that. Then the van pulled into a parking area above the rugged coastline and in direct sight of the ship. The occupants of the vehicle were still seated in the vehicle. However, their interior light was on and I could clearly see Mr Tang in the driver's seat. Uh, the headlights were still on, which suggests to me that he could have possibly been marking that spot for members on board that ship to travel to that point. Being the only other vehicle on the road, we had no other option at that stage but to continue past the Tarago. There's nowhere to pull over. So all Agent Roby could do was to make U-turns at certain intervals and drive past the suspects while he waited for backup. The area along um, the coastline there is extremely isolated and vehicles stand out, especially at that time of the evening. We were quickly trying to assess where, would, where we would be able to locate agents and surveillance members to continue physical surveillance of the suspects if the importation occurred. But just as reinforcements arrived, the suspects were on the move. Yeah, two at the front talking. Surveillance officers followed them to the Grand Pacific Hotel in Lawn. 
They watched as Ting took a phone call and then headed back alone to the place from where he'd come. The surveillance operatives noticed a car with its brake lights on parked at the side of the road honking its horn. They chose again to drive on by but noticed that Ting pulled over to meet the other vehicle which was a blue Ford Focus. They were able to gather a registration which the command centre quickly checked and it had been rented to a male by the name of Lamb, uh, confirming that the first unidentified male was now back in the picture. Knowing that the ship was so close to the shoreline and seemingly anchored, we were pretty sure the uh, importation would occur at any stage. It was going to be a difficult task for the undercover agents to see the handover occur. The beach below where the cars had been parked was hard for them to keep their eye on without being spotted. And the weather that night wasn't doing them any favours. It was really, really hard to actually see what was going on both at the vessel and on the beach. You couldn't see the vessel with the naked eye. The only way I was actually able to see it at stage was with the thermal imager. The weather was shocking. There was huge seas, and anybody coming off the boat in those sort of uh, swells must have been crazy, especially given the way that such a large boat was being thrown around. A smaller vessel, if it was coming off that boat, would have had a real hard time. Back at the Grand Pacific Hotel, the other male suspect had been nervously puffing on cigarettes for over an hour when Teng arrived back. The two returned to the cliff, and while agents following couldn't stop to see what was happening, the bug in the van was giving them some indication of what had occurred. Although we couldn't interpret the conversation at the time, something had changed with the situation down the shore party. Very quick, um, very jumbled conversations. We were being told that something was going on on the beach. I couldn't see that, and I was expecting something to go back from the beach back towards the ship that never eventuated. It was a frustrating moment in the investigation. We had a ship within a kilometre of the shoreline. We had a shore party and two vehicles. However, we couldn't see any handover of the drugs from the ship to the shore party. So it was decided to pull a lot of the members back to Lawn and wait for the narcotics to return with Teng in the Taraka. The Tarago returned to the Lawn Hotel and parked in one of the car parks underneath the hotel, and Teng and Lee were seen to head upstairs to their room. At a point after they went into their room, we had a federal agent go into the car park and look into the back of the Tarago. In the Tarago, two packages could be seen wrapped in blue tarpaulin type plastic and fishing net. So we were sure that the narcotics had arrived. We had a lot of options available. We could go and arrest them in the room, but however, that wouldn't show their actual knowledge of the, of the narcotics. We decided to wait until Teng and his companion returned to their Tarago before arresting them, so that they are in possession of the narcotics at the time of their arrest. The problem was, the packages weren't big enough to be 150 kilograms worth, and we'd now lost contact with the blue Ford Focus. Lamb, who had gone in a different direction after the handover, had used anti-surveillance techniques and the police had to drop off his tail. So we had to try and find that vehicle and find the narcotics. Not only that, they would need to find forensic evidence that would link the suspects to the scene where the handover had occurred and where the ship that they believe was involved was still anchored. But what they discovered was not what they expected. Dead person. It was the dawn of a new day, and the ship that was difficult to see the night before was still anchored off the coast of Lorne. It was now able to be identified as the Pong Su. We determined very quickly that the Pong Su had been recently registered to Tuvalu, a small nation in the Pacific, but that its previous origins were from North Korea. The transfer from being a North Korean ship took place less than a month before its arrival. They'd spent $12,000 changing the registration 
and we believe that was to not gain the attention of authorities as the ship moved in and around Australian waters. However, the Pong Su was detected and police believed a portion of drugs that was sitting in the van underneath this hotel had come from that ship. And the two suspects who had taken possession of those drugs were about to be arrested. Our plan at that stage was to try and contain them there, to do something to their car that made them stop to repair it. And we came up with letting down the front tire. They would then start to take off the wheel and we would cordon and contain them and, and arrest them peacefully. But things didn't go exactly according to plan, as, as happens in these situations. He had seen the flat tyre, looked around, definitely saw us sitting there, and he took off at quite a rate of knots. So we had to take this vehicle out as quickly as we could. We blocked it in so it couldn't move anymore, and then members of the SRS and advanced warrant team surrounded the vehicle and at uh, gunpoint extracted the driver and the passenger. When I arrived at the area, I saw Mr Tang face down on the road in handcuffs, restrained. And on the passenger side was the accomplice. He was fairly quiet. He didn't seem too ruffled by the situation at all. He certainly didn't seem like someone who was just attempting a large scale importation for the first time. He was right. As they discovered, Mr Chin Kwon Lee had form. He'd previously escaped from a jail in Denmark where he'd been arrested for uh, drug running in Europe. And he was well known to Interpol and had been involved in drug smuggling in and around Asia and Europe itself. The boot was open and there was what appeared to be 40 to 50 kilos of what we presumed was heroin from the nature of all the investigations. Merry Christmas. We knew we'd stop 40 to 50 million dollars worth of heroin on the street, so there were a lot of very happy federal police at that stage. Very the blocks were heavily wrapped in a number of layers of plastic. Uh, this might be your bottom line. And there's another layer there. Which went to the notion that they had been carried over from the ship. Each was marked with the brand Double UO Globe a high-quality brand of heroin. And when field tests were done, the contents were confirmed as being just that. Police have netted Victoria's biggest ever heroin haul, uncovering $60 million worth of the drug at a raid in Lawn. Police seized 40 kilograms of heroin concealed in waterproof bags as it was unloaded from a ship. While it was a great outcome to arrest two of the suspects, and locate part of what we believe the importation contained, we still had an outstanding suspect in relation to lamb and potentially another 100 kilos of heroin somewhere else in the area. We communicated with the Victoria Police and informed all the stations in the area that we were looking for a Blue Ford Focus with the registration details we had for lamb's vehicle. We had to split the members into different groups. Some of the federal agents had to bring back the two arrested suspects to Melbourne for interviewing. Other federal agents had to go and set up a crime scene where the importation had occurred so that we could tie any evidence on the beach back to Teng and Lee and the actual vessel that was still offshore at Boggley Creek. Yeah, I was surprised that it was still there. However, they obviously had a reason to hang around and we could see that the people around the bridge area were actually looking back to shore with binoculars. So we were starting to wonder whether they were actually looking at us. Once they are on the beach, they very quickly noticed an inflatable dinghy. From just looking at the dinghy, it obviously copped a hammering, was deflated. Um, the engine had obviously copped a knock, and it was quite obvious that it wasn't seaworthy. It sort of explained the reason why we never actually saw a boat go back out to the vessel and possibly explained why the people on the, uh, the Palm Sioux were looking into shore. Nearby, some kelp had taken their interest. Because there was rocks on top of the kelp, not kelp on top of the rocks, and nature generally dictates that the uh, kelp sits on top of the rocks. Underneath that pile, we found uh, two life jackets that had, had been uh, concealed. So once we knew that uh, the targets were actually burying things under piles of kelp 
or we started pushing along the beach a bit further and found another pile of kelp with rocks sitting on top of it. Thought this, this looks pretty good for probably the missing drugs. Dead person. I can certainly say that the last thing I expected to find under the seaweed was a, a dead body. He had a significant head wound. It looked to me as though he had been deliberately placed there and seaweed placed on top of him to conceal the fact that he was there. We are now in a really serious situation. There was a dead body on the beach. Potentially a murder may have occurred. We weren't sure. We had an amount of narcotics seized in lawn with two suspects and another suspect outstanding being Lamb, who still may have the narcotics. With the discovery of the two life jackets, police believed there was another suspect somewhere. But as they contemplated whether he was dead or alive, the Pong Zhu took off. We had a belief that the Pong Su was a vessel involved in the dropping off of the narcotics. We also had a belief that the deceased male may well have been a crew member. We needed to uh, get that vessel into an Australian port so we could have a thorough physical examination of the vessel and treat that vessel as a crime scene as well. Yes, Pong Su, here is police launch fearless. You are directed to turn your ship about. Over. Tell your captain that failing to obey this direction immediately, he is disobeying a direction under Australian customs law. Over. Pong Su, here is police launch fearless. Under the Australian Customs Act, you are hereby directed to alter course and make directly for Eden Port. Over. Uh, Mr. Pong Su, uh, we are having a breakfast uh, with a moment. And Pong Su, Pong Su, you are to alter course immediately for Eden Port. You are heading on a uh, course that is not appropriate. Over. As Australian Federal Police continued to urge the Pong Zhu into port, Victorian police divers had been brought into the investigation. There was some suggestion that there may have been a second person who uh, had come ashore and had not been located because there were two life jackets and that it was more than probable that that person was deceased because they'd only found the body of one person buried under some seaweed there earlier on that day. An autopsy of the dead man confirmed he had not been murdered, but had hit his head probably when the dinghy capsized and drowned. And with the swell still as dangerous as the night before, the dive to see whether there was another body was postponed. So whilst we were waiting for the seas to abate and the tide to go out, we started to search the um, sand and the beached area. Uh, and whilst we were, walked along the beach, we found a running shoe that had been washed up in, in a rock and it had a paint substance on the, on the sole. We also found a blue plastic bag and that bag had a tear in the side of it, which led us to believe that there may have been something in it that had since been removed, whether it had been torn on the rocks or whether somebody had actually cut it, we were unable to determine at that time. Above the area of the beach and just near to where the suspect's cars had been parked the night before, another officer had been searching for evidence. Uh, I made my way up to him. We moved through the bush and about seven metres from our location, we found a guy laying on the ground. He was laying in a... Not on him, mate, just be right. Yep, thanks. Like this? Yep. Over the ground here. We had a water bottle, half consumed, just there. Yep. We had a brown paper bag, just over here. OK. When we searched his bag, we found a set of binoculars, we found a torch, we found a phone, some SIM cards, and we found a GPS. The arrested man gave his name as Ta Song Wong, and while police suspected he was a crew member of the Pong Zhu and was directly involved in the handover of the drugs, they needed forensics to prove it. Wong was uh, using a piece of black rubber to hold his pants up, similar to the rubber used to package the narcotics that had been intercepted in Teng's Tarago. These strips of black rubber, like you'd get off the inner tube of a car, had been sliced into strips and just tied around to the bags to keep them shut. 
when something has been cut with a knife, you end up with what are called striated marks on the edges of the rubber, and they can literally be lined up like a jigsaw puzzle. And when Wong's makeshift belt was lined up with the ties from the heroin package, they were a perfect fit. We could certainly show that they had once been one piece before they were cut. The forensics investigation then moved on to actual fingerprinting. It was determined that both Wong and the dead man found on the shore's fingerprints were discovered inside the packaging of the narcotics themselves, inside the heroin boxes. The actual links of the rubber banding and Wong's fingerprints proved that Wong had some involvement in pre-packaging the heroin before it left the Pong Su itself, and that Wong had come from the ship on the dinghy the night before to deliver the narcotics to the shore party. And we also believe Wong was waiting in the observation post or the hide for the ship to come back and rescue him from the shore. The dinghy had capsized the night before and he had no other way of getting back to the ship. However, after the Pong Su became aware of the police activities on the shore, they then made their uh, escape into uh, the Australian waters. Yeah, you are directed under Australian customs laws to return to the port of Eden, steering a course of 270 for the purpose of boarding. Uh, Our task was to board that ship because we suspected there was more narcotics on board. And if there wasn't narcotics, there were certainly those people involved in importing a and a large amount of narcotics. Hong Su, stop your vessel. I repeat, stop your vessel. Now, tactical training to get aboard a ship when it's stable is one thing, but when it's moving is, in, is entirely another. We'd already lost one person in this operation. It was a suspect, but I certainly didn't want to lose any police members. So at that stage, whilst we'd sent one rubber dinghy out, I called them back in and said no, because the members were fully equipped with their ballistic vests and their helmets and all of their other equipment, which is quite heavy. And if one were to go overboard, no matter how good a swimmer they'd be, they'd go straight to the bottom. As their options were considered, agents on dry land were concentrating on finding Lamb, the member of the shore party who had so far evaded detection. We had to remember we still had a meeting point that had been set up prior to the importation in the Geelong Cunningham Pier area at that beach mark at 57B. So we had surveillance monitoring that uh, area the whole time. Lamb did turn up and parked right next to the 57B sign and a BMW. Lamb was seen to depart the vehicle and start brushing sand out of the boot area. At the same time, he was seen to have a conversation with the person from the BMW. Agents believed this other person could be involved in the actual importation as potentially another syndicate member who was there to pick up the narcotics from the night before. Although it appeared nothing had been handed over, the police weren't taking any chances. A decision was made to intercept the BMW to try and uh, identify the person in the vehicle but it was quickly determined that the person was just a member of the public and had no involvement in the actual investigation we were carrying out. Not long after the BMW left, Lamb was on his way. We couldn't afford to let Lamb get back to Melbourne and lose him again in a larger area. That's why the decision was made to intercept him at that stage so we could maintain control of him and the location of the narcotics. However, after searching his vehicle, we quickly discovered there were no drugs secreted in the car at all. The fact that Lamb had brushed sand from his car gave police hope that the drugs hadn't hit the streets of Melbourne and were hidden somewhere nearby. And in order to find them, they would literally need to turn to the heavens for help. While the AFP had arrested four men over the importation of 50 kilos of narcotics, they still believed up to 100 kilos of heroin was outstanding. They hoped that the GPS that was found on Wong might lead them to it. A global positioning system will display in coordinates on your device whereabouts on the world surface you are. So it's all to do with distance, time and signals that are sent from at least four satellites to the, the device that you're using to receive that data and it has an onboard memory and 
when we downloaded the information from the GPS. It was found on Wong and we found that there were 3,000 separate pieces of information contained on the memory within that device. However, it was quite apparent that Wong hadn't brought the GPS to the area because it had plotted a number of points in and around the coastal area of Lawn and Geelong for some time prior to the Pong Su arriving. In the period after the ship arrived and after the handover occurred, the coordinates for the GPS were in one place only, yep. the place that Wong had been found. And in that area, the missing heroine had not been located. We believed he'd been handed the GPS by one of the shore party when they discovered he couldn't get back to the ship. But it was the activity on the GPS before the ship arrived that was being scrutinised. Not only did the data marry up to all the places that the three suspects had been seen, but there was one spot, 40 kilometres away from the drop-off zone, that had been visited numerous times. And it was in the middle of nowhere. It was on the side of a road. Uh, and it really warranted a second look. The last known visit to the area was half an hour before the handover occurred. At that time, Teng and Lee were under surveillance, so the person holding the GPS was more than likely to be Lam, and police wondered whether he may have returned to the site with heroin in hand. And as we approached the point, I was just reading off the GPS, and it said 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, it said we're here. And uh, I looked down on the ground, I picked up a plastic bag, and contained within that plastic bag was two photographs of lamb. While no heroin was discovered in this area, other vital evidence had been. There was a mobile phone starter kit with lamb's fingerprint upon it. Most importantly, there was an A4 sheet of paper that was their shipping invoice for the Pong Soup. This was significant because Mr Lamb had indicated that he was not involved in this incident at all. And we'd now found physical evidence that linked Lamb to the Pong Su, which was currently heading up the coast towards Sydney. Pong Su, stop your vessel now. You have been told and warned numerous times. Are you altering course back to Eden Cordover? No, no, he's making a run for it. Come Hong on. Su, if you do not stop your vessel or alter course, we will stop your vessel or the Australian government will stop your, your vessel using any method available. We were tasked to follow the ship and to cover it. Meantime, the people back in headquarters were getting the people most skilled and best equipped to do the actual takeout of the of the vessel. Motor vessel Hong Su, this is Australian warship. Rig your Pilot ladder, starboard side, now. General, the, at the present now, my crew members now sleeping now, so waiting some moment. No, sir, please awake them up. I intend to board you. Over. The HMAS Stewart was sent from Sydney to intercept the Pong Su. Once it made contact with the Pong Su, it sent a helicopter where SAS soldiers uh, boarded the ship and made it safe for the AFP to go on board. It now became another crime scene for us to search to try and link the evidence on board the Pong Su with the rest of the evidence we had seized during the investigation. Okay, the time is uh, 11.52 on Sunday the 20th of April 2003. The thorough search of the ship showed us that it was most probably a smuggling ship for the purpose of actually moving narcotics in and around the world. Water tanks on the ship had been converted to fuel tanks, basically giving the ship a greater capacity to travel without stopping to take on fuel. A huge amount of food had been found on the ship, also allowing the crew to survive for some time without going to port. The reason for this would be obvious. By not having to go to port, especially in Australia, they wouldn't come to the attention of authorities that may be wanting to check the ship. A systematic search began this morning. Every room, cupboard and panel. Specialised x-ray and chemical equipment taken aboard. Even the ship's filter and vents were checked. We were given a running shoe from the beach near the dead body, which had a number of paint stains on it and we were asked if there was any possibility that we could match paint from the shoe with any paint found on the Pong Su. Paint samples and scrapings from the deck of the ship were analysed and compared. 
We were able to match a number of features of the paint, not conclusively, not 100%, but very, very likely that the paint on the shoe was the same as found on the deck of the Pong suit. When the dead person was found, he wasn't wearing shoes. So the links between the dead man, Wong, the ship and the shore party continue to grow. But we still had the problem of the missing narcotics that we believe Mr Lamb was in possession of at some stage. We had to find it. It was imperative that that drug be discovered before someone else got their hands on it. The night the drugs came ashore and were handed over to the shore party, Teng and Lee headed back to Lawn to their hotel. Lamb had headed in the opposite direction. Our surveillance operative attempted to follow Lamb, however, he was using what's known as anti-surveillance measures. As a result, the agents dropped off Lamb, but they knew the direction he had travelled. Now, an extensive search along a 25-kilometre stretch of road and bushland was being undertaken. It took a few days, but eventually we won. We found the drugs in a small trench covered in leaves and other trees. It was obvious that these were the narcotics that originally came ashore with the Pong Su. They had the same wrapping, the same blue tarpaulin, the fish nets, and the black rubber banding to hold it all together. To see those drugs to be found and seized was pretty gratifying. It was very, very satisfying to, to take possession of it and take it out of circulation. The raid on board the Pong Su followed the seizure of 50 kilograms of heroin off Victoria's southwest coast. Another 75 kilograms of the drug was discovered hidden in bushes, a total street value of $164 million. The ship's captain, chief mate and chief engineer were today ordered to stand trial after a magistrate found they were in a position to assist in the drug run. A crew member who allegedly brought the heroin to shore and three others accused of collecting it will also stand trial. Teng, Lee and Lam all pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting the importation of a commercial quantity of heroin. Ta Song Wong pleaded guilty to its importation. But a jury found the captain and his two senior staff not guilty. Regardless of who surrounding that narcotic importation is convicted, uh, at the end of the day you have to be happy with the fact that we achieved what we wanted to achieve and that was to stop the narcotics reaching the community. If you look at the figures in 1999 of how many people a year were dying from heroin, it was up to about 1,200 people a year. And now it's back down to around 300 people a year. So we have made a difference. The 4,000 tonne vessel was towed out to sea about 140 kilometres off the New South Wales south coast. An F-111 jet fighter lined up the vessel and bombed it. That syndicate won't be doing that again. That ship won't be doing it again. It's at the bottom of the ocean, so the results were very good. I think it did send a very strong message right around the world that Australia won't put up with this.